Um, I'm going to be talking. Well, first of all, my name is Kim Stenger. I'm the head of the firm's health law group. We're going to be talking today about difficult discharge situations. These are situations that um, typically apply uh, uh, arise in hospitals where you've got a patient that is ready to be discharged and you want to discharge them, but uh, there's no place for that patient to go. A couple of preliminaries. You should have received a copy of the PowerPoints. If you didn't and you would like a copy of those, you can email Charles. I sent a message on the chat feature that has his email address so that you can get that, or you can just email me. Um, there's, I also referenced an article that I wrote uh, along with some other colleagues a while ago. You can access that article on this website, which might provide some additional guidance. Uh, by way of background, this is actually from a presentation I recently did uh, for the Idaho Hospital Association. So a lot of my references are to Idaho law, um, but you need so you need to check your own law to make sure what your particular state law might require. I decided to go ahead and leave in the Idaho examples, however, because I think that um, a lot of laws have a lot of states have similar laws. So I wanted to at least point those out so you could check and maybe um, see whether those types of uh, the analysis applies in your particular state. Uh, if you have questions during the program, we won't take questions during the program, but you can submit those during the uh, using the chat feature. You can just email me and I'll respond offline. All right, with those preliminaries, let's talk about it. So, as I mentioned, you sometimes have those situations where you've got a patient, either they want to leave and they shouldn't leave, or you would like them to leave and they refuse to leave. The problem can arise with competent patients where they want to leave, but they need continuing care. That's usually not much of a problem. You just, if they're competent, they generally have the right to, to leave. And so you would just document that they are leaving against medical advice, make sure that you've got appropriate documents, that they were competent to make that determination. You should be fine. Uh, in some situations, your state law might allow you to initiate a mental hold, although those, those rarely apply in the situation where this patient is competent. The, the problem for competent patients, though, may arise more often if you've got a situation where the patient's appropriate for transfer or discharge, but they refuse to leave. Maybe they just haven't got a better place to go. They like the room service that you give them. They like the, the care. They think that they can get care cheaper or, or avoid having to pay for care. And so they just simply refuse to leave. Um, that's a problem. Um, probably not as big as the next situation is when you're dealing with incompetent patients. So if you've got an incompetent patient, a patient who can't make their own healthcare decisions under your particular state law, you may have a situation where they want to leave, but they need more care. Well, that's usually not too problematic because under most states laws, you simply would need to obtain consent from a surrogate decision maker, or most states will have a, a law that will allow you to place a mental hold on a, a patient and continue to provide care. The more problematic situation is where they don't need more care at your facility or the care should more appropriately be provided at another particular another facility but that patient is either non-compliant with treatment or they need additional care but the other care settings are unavailable either because the patient lacks resources or maybe the patient is violent or bad behavior and another facility won't take them and so you're stuck with them in this meantime you would like to be able to get them out but you haven't got a place to send them. So what do you do in that situation? Well, the problem with this, of course, if you keep patients unnecessarily, it's just the cost of the system. I mean, look at the, the average comparisons. I think the numbers from 2022 or 2021, the last couple of years for a ho average hospital stay is about $2,600 per day. For a nursing home, I mean, it's still expensive, but it's approximately $300 a day. So it's a lot more efficient to have people appropriately housed in a nursing home or maybe assisted living facility or maybe receiving home health situations. Um, if you are keeping the patient unnecessarily, then of course it could divert the resources from needy persons. You've, there's a finite amount of money that you have, a finite amount of resources at your facility. And if you're wasting those on people who really don't need it, that it could um, detract from those who really do need it. it. Especially if you've got behavioral issues, it just takes a terrible physical and emotional drain on staff. A lot of times these people are, are violent and they could um, harm your staff. And it's just the emotional strain of it all is, is terrible. These people create a liability risk, whether it's a fall risk or hurting other people. There could be risk of harm to the patient by having them in the facility. And by keeping them there unnecessarily, you could be subject yourself to administrative action, either 
Uh, maybe you're not licensed in your particular state to hold this person long term, or maybe if this person's violent, creating work uh, workplace violence, then you might have problems with OSHA or the like. Uh, so on the one hand, you've got problems if you keep the patient unnecessarily. On the other hand, you've got problems if you discharge that patient improperly. Well, if you assumed care, then you have a duty and you could be subject to personal liability if you don't handle it properly. Uh, maybe uh, if you've got a contract liability, either with a payer or otherwise, you may be liable for a breach of contract if you don't handle it properly, including going through appropriate discharge criteria. Medicare and Medicaid, of course, you could violate, if you're a hospital, the conditions for participation or for other facilities, conditions for coverage if you discharge improperly. Could result in adverse licensing action, which in turn could result in loss of or restriction of license, monetary penalties. If nothing else, you could be hit up with adverse publicity. Uh, you remember a few years ago, there was a whole spate, a whole series of these situations where facilities were caught in the news by exercising what's called Greyhound therapy, where they would just take a patient down and, and dump them off at the Greyhound station or buy them a bus ticket to someplace else, send them to someplace else so they're somebody else's problem. You know, obviously that doesn't sit very well and make you look very well if, that, if you show up on the news for those situations. So those are the problems. Let's talk about what the legal parameters are. What are the rules that apply in these situations? Well, for determining competency, that's the initial thing that you need to determine because that really determines your course of action going forward. Uh, most states will have a, either a statute or they will have a, a case that'll define what when a person is or is not competent to consent to their own health care or refuse health care. In Idaho, we actually have a statute. It was recently amended under the current standard. It says that uh, any person who comprehends the need for the nature of and the significant risks ordinarily inherent in any contemplated health care service is competent to consent thereto on his or her own behalf. Any health care provider may provide such health care services in reliance upon such a consent. Okay, So that's the standard. If you want to know, at least in Idaho, if a person is competent, then you would apply that standard. If they can make their own health care decisions, then you know, they generally have the right to consent to or refuse their own health care. On the other hand, if they are incompetent, they can't make their own health care decisions, then I think in every state there will be a process or a hierarchy for identifying those who can make decisions for them. In Idaho, we've actually got a statute that sets forth the hierarchy up there on those who can make decisions for those who are minors or otherwise incompetent, and it starts at the top, goes to the bottom. So if the patient's incompetent, there's no prior expressed wishes or advanced directive from the patient explaining how their care is going to be done, then you would look to see if there's a court-appointed guardian. If no court-appointed guardian, then a person named in an advanced care planning document like a, a, a health care power of attorney. If not, then if they're married, then it's going to be the spouse who will make the decisions. If there's no spouse, then an adult child would make the decisions. If there's no adult child, then the parent of the person if there's no parent, then you just continue to go through the list, right? And identify those who can go ahead and make decisions if the person's incompetent. So if you've got the surrogate decision maker, they're on board with what you want to do, you should be protected. You'll just want to document that the patient's incompetent and this person had the appropriate authority. If the surrogate, though, refuses to agree to an appropriate course of action, then problems can potentially exist. All right, the next one is EMTALA. You know, your best recourse is to not get these people into your facility, but of course you're limited by EMTALA if you are a hospital that is participating in Medicare or Medicaid. EMTALA states that a hospital with a dedicated emergency department, if that patient comes to the hospital, you've got to provide an appropriate screening exam, stabilizing treatment, and or an appropriate transfer. And you can't transfer that patient unless you jump through certain hoops. Either the patient's conditions has been stabilized or the patient was admitted in good faith as an inpatient or if the patient refuses care or requests the transfer, if you document that, or if you, the physician certifies that the benefits outweigh the risks and you otherwise make sure that it's an appropriate transfer. That applies to hospitals with dedicated emergency departments. If the patient shows up there, you got to provide that screening exam and stable, necessary stabilizing treatment under EMTALA. Even if you don't have an, a dedicated emergency department, if you are a hospital that is participating in Medicare or Medicaid, then you have an affirmative obligation uh, and you have specialized capabilities, you cannot refuse the transfer of a patient who needs your specialized capabilities. If you do, it's an EMTALA, oblig uh, EMTALA violation. We'll talk more about application of that in, in just a minute. What are the penalties for EMTALA violations? Well, you can get hit up with 
civil penalties. You can also be excluded from Medicare or Medicaid. Most of the time, you'll just have to do a, a, a corrective action plan and that should stave off the requirements. But there are penalties, uh, administrate the potential for administrative penalties. In addition, um, patients or individuals who are harmed by EMTALA violations can sue the hospital for those violations. Now, EMTALA applies if the patient shows up, you've got to give them the emergency uh, medical screening exam to determine whether or not the patient has an emergency medical condition. That generally means that the person's going to be injured if they don't receive immediate care. In the case of psychological conditions, the regulations or the interpreter guidelines indicate that uh, they have an emergency medical or psychological condition if the individual is expressing suicidal or homicidal thoughts or gestures or determined to be a dangerous be dangerous to themselves or others. So if that's the case, then you have to provide stabilizing treatment or inappropriate transfer. You can't just ship them on. EMTALA obligations end, you know, they don't continue forever. They end if either you do an appropriate screening exam and determine that the person does not have an emergency condition, which remember psychological conditions can be an emergency condition, or if the emergency condition is stabilized, EMTALA obligations may end, but you still may have malpractice obligations. You still may have obligations under the conditions of participation, but EMTALA obligations would end. Or if you admit the patient is a, in good faith as an inpatient, once you either the patient stabilized or you admit them, then EMTALA ends, but you still may have obligations under you know, the common law duty of due care plus um, your conditions of participation. Now, note that when you admit that patient in good faith as an inpatient, that admission terminates EMTALA not only for the place where the patient is located, the hospital where the, the patient is located, but also any other hospital with specialized capabilities that would otherwise be obligated to accept that patient, EMTALA ends for them also. So if you're a small facility or a facility that takes in a patient you know that you need to send them to or you want to send them to a hospital with specialized capabilities that you don't have, be careful about admitting that patient because once you admit them, then that receiving facilities in TALA obligations are going to terminate also and they may not be obligated to accept that, that patient. All right, aside from those regulatory requirements, you have to be concerned about personal injury damages because once you assume the care of a patient, you also assume duties to uh, treat that patient consistent with the standard of care. That breach of duty may subject you to any kind of number of penalties uh, for personal injury lawsuits for malpractice, lack of informed consent, could be battery, kidnapping, whatever it might be. You could be subjecting yourself once you undertake that treatment. If you don't do it properly, then you could be liable for damages. And that duty, that obligation continues until you properly terminate that relationship. You could also, you have to be also be aware of the hospital licensing regulations. Your particular state may have certain requirements, particularly when it comes to discharge requirements. For example, those are the discharge requirements for um, Idaho up there. It generally requires that, um, you know, you have some kind of discharge planning process. In addition, for hospitals, the Medicare conditions of participation for both critical access hospitals and um, regular acute care hospitals have requirements for discharge planning. The um, conditions of participation for um, critical access hospitals were recently added, but for general acute care hospitals, you've got to engage in discharging planning for your inpatients. You've got, that means that you have to identify patients when they come in who are likely to suffer adverse health consequences, absent adequate discharge planning. You've got to provide discharge planning evaluation including assessment of the patient's capacity for self-care or care by others post-discharge. You've got to prepare a discharge plan if your evaluation indicates the need or a physician requests a discharge plan. In conjunction with that, you've got to counsel with the patient and their family. You must include a list of post-acute care providers as appropriate. Um, perhaps most relevant to our discussion today, you've got to arrange for the initial implementation of that discharge plan post-acute care and you must transfer or refer the patients and medical information to an appropriate facility agency or services as needed. Now, this is a quick summary of the hospital COPS regarding discharge planning. By the way, the critical access hospital new conditions of participation are similar to that. 
Um, among other things, you've got to transfer refer, refer patients and medical information to appropriate facilities, agencies, or services as needed. Now, in both of these documents, um, I think that there's an understanding out there, and a lot of people assume that the condition of participation prohibits you from discharging to an unsafe, unsafe care setting. That may be the practical effect, but that's not necessarily what this particular guidance says. It just says that you've got to plan with the patient and their family, come up with an appropriate plan, take appropriate steps to implement a post-discharge setting, but it doesn't necessarily categorically prohibit you from discharging somebody or providing continuing care until the person can be discharged safely. It's a little bit of a gray area, and I've scoured the, the guidance from the government on this particular issue, and I think the government is hesitant to take that next step that says that you must keep this patient forever and you can never discharge them if it's going to be an unsafe discharge. I just don't think that's what it says. The commentary that does accompany the discharge rules say things like, for example, we understand that their situations may arise where the patients may prefer not to participate in the discharge planning process. For those situations, basically, the government just said that, you know, you've documented the medical record. If they don't want to participate in the discharge planning process, then you document that. You can't force them to do it. More to the point for our discussion today, the commentary for uh, medical access for um, acute care hospitals when it comes to discharging planning says hospitals have certain constraints on their ability to accomplish patient transfers and referrals. They recognize that a patient may refuse transfer or referrals or there may be financial barriers limiting the facilities, agencies, or ambulatory care service providers' willingness to accept the patient. In such cases, the hospital does not have financial responsibility for the post-acute care services. However, hospitals are expected to be knowledgeable about resources available in their community to address such financial barriers, such as Medicaid services, the availability of FQHCs, area agencies on agency, et cetera, and to take steps to make those resources available to the patient. For example, in most states, hospitals work closely with the Medicaid program to expedite enrollment of patients eligible for Medicaid, presumably so that they can then find a post acute acute facility. The key here is that the conditions of participation do not, at least my, by my read, do not prohibit you from discharging somebody, even if the discharge, if that patient is appropriate for discharge, even if they don't necessarily have a great place for them to land. Now, what you'll probably want to do is you want to work with your surveyors, check with your local agencies to see how they interpret that and take a look at it. And obviously there are other reasons why you wanna make sure that you have appropriate safe discharges, including to avoid personal liability, but just make sure that you don't overread the conditions of participation. The most recent guidance that came out in June of this year, again, it focuses on providing information to post a care uh, about post-acute care providers, but it doesn't necessarily guarantee uh, or the continuation of, of post-acute care or require you to continue to hold that patient indefinitely. Uh, Medicare, of course, has their uh, patient discharge rights. States may also have theirs. You've got to give that important message to Medicare in most cases, and you've got to give the patient the appeal process, so you'd have to jump through those hoops before you just try to discharge. A couple of final points when you're talking about the general lay of the legal um, parameters that when you're dealing with these discharge cases, you know, we've talked about the limits on your ability to discharge and make sure that you can discharge appropriately, whether or not that means you actually have to, per, can't discharge without a, uh, to a safe setting is another issue. Um, but on the other hand, remember that there's also other regulations that require you to provide a safe working environment for your staff, including the OSHA general duty clause, which has been interpreted according to OSHA to, you know, make sure that you take appropriate steps to protect your people from, for example, workplace violence. Um, make sure that you monitor the OSHA stuff. Uh, we anticipate getting additional guidance from OSHA in the healthcare setting, particularly dealing with workplace violence, but that hasn't quite issued yet. But that's the other side of the coin, right? You've got this patient, you've got to protect the patient, but you've also got an obligation to protect the staff. Finally, remember HIPAA issues. If you are going to take action, make sure that you're careful and you maintain HIPAA confidentiality, including if you file litigation or the like, like we'll talk about in a little bit. 
Oh, and remember discrimination statutes. The government has said that, you know, inappropriate discharge may in some cases implicate discrimination statutes, although that's not your main concern. Um, beware of contract limitations, um, either with the patient, for example, maybe you're an ELF and you have admission agreements that limit your ability to discharge. Um, you may have network contracts that require you to continue to provide care for, for patients unless you satisfy certain criteria or certain steps through the discharge process. And of course, payer contracts, including Medicare and Medicaid, they may also have discharge criteria or requirements that you have to jump through before you can discharge a patient. If you fail to do so, you can be subject to those penalties. And aside from all the regulatory stuff, aside from the lawsuits, beware about the bad press. Again, you don't want to be the local story uh, on the news tonight because you dropped off somebody or kicked somebody out the, the facility inappropriately. All right, that's kind of the problem. That's kind of the legal lay of the land. Let's talk about some of the suggestions. Well, again, your best course for dealing with these disruptive or inappropriate patients is to avoid taking them in the first place. Generally, you're not obligated to take any patient or continuing any patient so long as you don't abandon the patient. Now, there are a couple of limitations on that. One is if EMTALA applies, obviously, you've got to comply with EMTALA. But remember, EMTALA does not apply if the patient has not come to the hospital for emergency care. So generally, if somebody calls up and says, hey, we want to send somebody over to you, you're not obligated to take them unless under EMTALA you're a hospital with specialized capabilities. Even if you are contacted by a hospital who wants to send them to you, you're not required to take them if that patient has been stabilized at that other facility or that that patient was admitted at the other facility because EMTALA ends in those situations, or if you don't have specialized capabilities. The other facility is on the same par. They can provide the same services that you would provide. Then under EMTALA, you're not obligated to accept that patient transfer. Um, let's say, say that you do get that patient, then what can you do? Well, you begin the discharge planning promptly. Make sure that you get in the patient's mind or their surrogate's mind that, look, this is a temporary solution. We're, we're here to provide acute care. We're not here to provide long-term care. That's not what we do. So confirm your anticipated needs. Make sure you start from the get-go to work to secure a payer source, whether it's Medicare, Medicaid, VA benefits, private payers, uh, ACA plans, whatever it is because usually you can't send the patient out because you can't find a payer source. Um, there's usually, eventually, you can usually find another facility that's willing to take them as long as there's a payer source. So begin lining up that payer source as soon as possible. Um, line up, begin lining up the post-discharge resources. Start planning early, whether it's some kind of post-acute care provider like a SNF or an ALF or home health or maybe other community-based resources. So start from the beginning and make sure that the patient or their surrogates understand that this is the process, this is the flow, this is where you're going to go. If you educate that patient from the outset about the discharge process, you have these plans in place, then that makes it easier when that issue comes. It may resolve a lot of your problems upfront and make, make it easier at the back end to make sure that that patient both voluntarily goes or if you need to kick them out, that you've got a good basis for doing so. Now, all of that that I just talked about is consistent with the COPS. That's pretty much what the COPS, the conditions of participation or conditions for coverage for other long-term care facilities require you to do anyway. So let's say that you've got a patient that simply is refusing to leave. What do you do about that? Well, make sure, first of all, you understand why. A lot of times, you know, I'll get a call and they'll say, this patient's here, we, we need to send them out, but we, they won't go or their family's refusing to let them go. And I'll ask them, well, why? Why aren't they? And a lot of times the people, well, we really don't know. Well, we'll find out because you're only going to be able to address those concerns if you know what those concerns are. Um, you know, why are they staying there? Why are they refusing to leave? Is it ignorance concerning the operation options or the cost of, of alternative care or the care that you are providing? Do they feel they're not medically ready to leave? You know, can you address that by having appropriate discussions with the care team, as well as pointing out or explaining to them the post-acute care setting where they will continue to get appropriate care? Is it fear about leaving the hospital setting or transferring to a new care setting? They just don't understand or don't feel comfortable. Can you bring in the other care setting, have them meet with the person so that they do feel comfortable, bring in information? Do they have certain gains for remaining in the hospital? They'd like to sit there and watch TV or whatever. Um, are, do they have behavioral problems? If they do, what is the cause of the problem? Is it 
Um, are there triggering events? Is it lack of medication or appropriate medication? You know, can you address those situations? Um, is there a reason for their non-compliance with medications or treatment? Um, is there secondary gain going on? Is it um, lack of understanding, lack of understanding about their medications, whatever? The key there is to make sure that you understand why they're not cooperating and address those concerns. Um, you may want to uh, establish patient contracts, especially if you think a particular patient's going to be um, difficult, then establish up front that uh, what the patient responsibilities are, as well as the facility responsibilities. We, we tend to give the patients, you know, as we're required to, uh, certain obligations about their rights, but usually don't give them anything that, that identifies what their responsibilities are. Establishing some kind of patient contract or some kind of patient responsibility form that the patient gets, hopefully they sign, or if they're disruptive, that they sign a patient contract in which they specify or they clarify or agree that, yeah, in order for us to provide effective care, you've got to do certain things, including you've got to engage in professional and respectful conduct, you've got to participate in appropriate plan of care, that you are responsible for the payment. Um, you may want to include those types of documents in your basic admission documentation. Um, if you didn't, or if you've got a situation where the, pac the patient's be uh, misbehaving later on, you may want to put in place one of those behavior contracts. The benefit of doing that is twofold. One is, if the patient signs something and um, you can point to that to show, look, if you agreed that you were going to comply with this, then sometimes, you know, if they're rational, then they will realize, okay, I, I, I do need to comply with that. Even if they're not going to comply with it, though, it will make it easier to, for you to discharge them later if you need to get third-party involvement with a court or something else. If you can show that, look, we gave them warning, they agreed to this, or we notified them that these were their responsibilities and they simply refused, then that kind of diffuses the, um, the bad aura that may be around you, like you're just trying to kick this guy out. And it shows that it's really these people's problem. They're refusing to cooperate or participate and they can help you down the road. All right, the way these things are most often resolved, probably 90% of the time they're resolved simply by locating alternative care settings, providers or resources. So quite often you're just gonna, even though you'd like to kick this person out, you're most often you're gonna have to, or we'll end up keeping them until you can provide another appropriate care setting and work out an agreement with them. That could be state facilities, maybe um, state dementia facilities, the state hospitals, um, Idaho has its Southwest Idaho Treatment Center, which will take um, severely developmentally disabled persons. Idaho has a secure treatment facility for criminally, um, those who, are, who have engaged in criminally bad behavior, who otherwise have um, uh, developmental disabilities or perhaps mental issues. Um, there's a lot of states are members of an interstate compact for mentally deficient persons. So if there aren't resources in the state, that they've got compacts that would allow you to ship the patient across state lines to other facilities in other states. Uh, look at your state programs that may help facilitate care. Um, look for other appropriate hospitals, including those with specialized capabilities who may be obligated to receive them. Uh, skilled nursing, assisted living or memory care, mental or behavioral health centers. Um, the patient may be with appropriate medication, appropriate for simply um, to send home with their residents with, with appropriate home health, family or other appropriate caregivers. It may be certain circumstances, maybe a hotel or an apartment. If they've just got a place to go for a period of time, maybe they're willing to go. A halfway house or transitional housing. Are there other community resources that will help you transition this patient out of your facility? Um, just the bottom line is know what your resources and your options are, and then look for opportunities that will allow you to transfer this patient safely to someplace else. Again, most of those other facilities are going to depend on whether or not you can uh, identify an appropriate payer source. So as soon as that patient gets into your facility, work to identify a, a payer source. That could be from government programs like Medicare, Medicaid, VA, CHIP, food stamps, whatever. It could also be private payers. I mean, look, does the patient have insurance? Um, can they purchase insurance on the exchange or could you purchase insurance on the exchange for them that would, would cover the cost of their care? Um, do they have employee benefits? Do they have assets or family resources? Are there community resources that are available to help fund the, the care that would allow you to um, 
provide care and transfer the care to another facility that's willing to accept the patient. Um, if it is a patient that you've received at your facility, they require services that um, you can't provide to either complete a screening exam or to stabilize the patient, then um, you can look to transfer the patient to another hospital with specialized capabilities under EMTALA. Under EMTALA, that other facility is obligated to accept that patient if they have specialized capabilities. They generally can't place conditions on that transfer or the like. You just want to make sure that if you're going to do that, that um, you don't admit the patient because once you admit the patient at your facility, then the other receiving facility's obligation to accept the transfer is cut off and terminates, or if the patient is stabilized. That other hospital with specialized capabilities may refuse the transfer if they have the transferring hospital has similar capabilities, so the receiving facility does not have specialized capabilities, or the transferring hospital had admitted the patient as an inpatient, or it's a transfer from outside the United States. Note, however, that EMTALA only prohibits you from, or accepts transfers outside the United States. Even if you're transferring across state lines, EMTALA would allow you to transfer across state lines. Um, it would require hospitals with specialized capabilities in other states to accept that transfer from other states. And I've seen literally situations where hospitals up in Alaska have transferred patients down to uh, hospitals in the lower 48 or hospitals from you know, multiple states away transfer patients over. Um, I've had sometimes hospitals call up and say, this is crazy. Why do we have to accept this patient when the, the, the patient's gonna be flying over hundreds of other hospitals in order to get to our facility. And the bottom line is there that, well, um, EMTALA does not place a geographic proximity as long as it's within the United States. Um, you're obligated to accept that. Now, there is commentary in the interpretive guidelines that may help you if you are getting dumped in these situations. The interpretive guidelines do say that hospitals that request transfers must recognize that the appropriate transfer of individuals with unstabilized emergency medical Conditions that require specialized services should not routinely be made over great distances, bypassing closer hospitals with needed capability and capacity. So I've used that sometimes with those transferring hospitals. If they're dumping on, on remote or far away hospitals, I've used that to say, look it, we'll accept them this time, but just so you know, this is what the interpretive guidelines say, and we think you're acting inappropriately. It's not in the patient's best interest, so you may have regulatory liability in addition to um, malpractice liability. All right, another option is to try commitment proceedings where you commit the patient to a facility either um, through the consent of the, the surrogate or if the patient lacks capacity, then you can initiate commitment proceedings under state law. For example, Idaho has a mental hold statute that allows you to hold a patient for 24 hours while you initiate this commitment proceeding. Now, in Idaho, as in a lot of states, that only applies to certain types of patients. It only applies, this 24-hour hold only applies to those who suffer a mental illness. And as modified in 2022, mentally ill is defined as a condition resulting in a substantial disorder of thought, mood, perception, orientation that grossly impairs judgment, behavior, or capacity to recognize and adapt to reality and requires care and treatment at a facility. They have specifically in Idaho in 2022, they amended that definition to exclude neurological disorders, neurocognitive disorders, developmentally disabled disabilities, or so forth. So in Idaho, to initiate that 24 hour hold, it has to be caused by some kind of psychiatric condition, not some kind of organic developmental disability or TBI or those types of things. You would need to look for another way to commit that person um, under those particular statutes. Um, Idaho does have a um, different proceeding so that for those who are developmentally disabled, that you can initiate, uh, so that maybe they don't fit within the 24 hour mental hold statute or commitment proceeding. There's a separate one for those who are developmentally disabled that you can initiate that process, including um, treating practitioners can initiate that, that process to commit the person into the the custody of health and welfare. Um, the problem with that, of course, is under the definition of developmental disability, it only applies if that developmental disability uh, began um, when the patient was younger than, or 22 or younger, 
And therefore, if it developed afterwards, then they may not fit within that commitment proceeding. So in Idaho, we've got this gap for these commitment proceedings, uh, persons who are not mentally ill, they may have a developmental disability, but it began later in life, and therefore they may not be appropriate for this commitment proceeding process. Um, it's, it's a problem in Idaho that needs to be corrected. Hopefully your other states, if you're in another state, that you don't necessarily have those same concerns. But just remember that you may have a commitment process that you can initiate that or work with a prosecutor or work with the, the family to initiate these commitment proceedings to get them into state custody and so that the state takes over at the state hospital or whatever it might be. Um, in Idaho, there may be also be, a, a, there is also in Idaho a separate proceeding if the person's engaged in criminal um, behavior. Um, the judge may order the person to be detained and sent to an Idaho facility, a secure treatment facility, while they determine whether or not the person is competent to stand trial. That's a rare case that will be implicated, but I have had one or two situations where we've tried to invoke that or have invoked that in order to get the patient out of the hospital. All right, so let's say you can't initiate the commitment proceedings yet or in the process of initiating those commitment proceedings. Another option is to go to your state Department of Health and Welfare or whatever it is in your particular state, the, the agency that handles these types of situations and work with them to find, find a solution. Um, among other things, you may try to negotiate with health and welfare to help cover your cost of keeping the person while they are in your facility. Maybe have them um, provide the one-on-one -on -one sitter or provide additional care providers to come in there and, and help care for this particular person that just you just happen to be housing in your facility. Um, you may try to charge them or agree for health and welfare to cover the cost for the additional care rendered by the hospital. Now, that's not a long-term solution, but it may help mitigate the costs and relieve the stress and the, the emotional concerns of your staff members in the meantime. Um, health and welfare your, or your state law equivalent may not be willing to do that, so sometimes you may have to apply political pressure or even perhaps threaten to file suit if they don't step up to their responsibilities to care for these disabled persons in the community. Um, there is, you know, I have considered and I've threatened lawsuits against the state sometime. Um, there are, is federal precedent that suggests that the state may have obligations to provide care for these individuals. Uh, for example, in the Olmstead case, a 1999 case, where the United States Supreme Court said that at least under ADA Title II, that states had an obligation to provide care for mental uh, persons with mental disabilities in the community wherever possible, rather than in an institutional setting. Now that's specific to those particular facts. It may depend upon your particular state law program, um, whether or not your state law provides these mental um, situations or not. But the, the bottom line there is you may have to ultimately um, consider taking action against the state under some constitutional or some state law pro, uh, provision that would require the state to step in and accept responsibility and to accept the transfer of a particular patient under whatever theory that you can in order to get that. All right, another option might be, um, you know, you see this not infrequently where a patient is maybe acting out or um, decompensates at a skilled nursing facility or assisted living facility, they appropriately so send the patient over to the hospital to get the care. The hospital is obligated to, to accept the patient if it's an, emer an EMTALA situation. So they provide the care, but now you want to send the patient back to the nursing facility, but the nursing facility or the ALF refuse to take them back. Well, um, some states, including Idaho and the conditions of participation, do have uh, bed hold statutes that require the the facilities to hold beds for a particular period of time. You may be able to rely on that, and I've used that in, in threatening those facilities to accept the patient back. Um, or it may be under the, the terms of the admission agreement um, or the, uh, the specified services agreement that may require them to take the patient back or prohibit them from discharging the patient unless they satisfy certain criteria. Um, Usually, though, that's not a very effective method of handling those situations because almost always the state law will 
have an exception that if they, you, the facility can't provide the care or the patient has medical needs that um, can't be satisfied, that that would allow them to send the patient out. And um, usually, even if you're able to get the patient back, um, the patient will decompensate and they'll end up back at your, your facility. So you may try to work with the, um, the patient in order to, um, you may try to work with that other long-term care facility to receive the patient, but as an ultimate solution, it's kind of hard to force that, that long-term care facility to receive that patient back. If the patient's incompetent, you're going to want to involve a, an appropriate surrogate decision maker, because if you are trying to send them or want to send them to a long-term care facility, that long-term care facility is going to want to make sure that there is somebody who can consent to care, consent to payment for the care and the like. So if the patient's incompetent, you're going to want to involve the appropriate surrogate decision maker. Um, make sure that you know, um, you know, who those surrogate decision makers are, whether there's a guardian, whether you must get a for a guardian appointed. A lot of states will have processes or counties will have processes for the appointment of a, a board of uh, a guardian if there is no family member that's available or willing to take it. So you'll want to. Um, start that process sooner rather than later so that you can identify an appropriate person to make appropriate health care decisions or facilitate the transfer of that patient someplace else, or in some cases, um, work with you in initiating an, appointment, uh, an appropriate commitment proceeding to turn them into state custody. You may have situations where the family member or the caretaker refuses to get involved, whether it's a parent, whether it's uh, you know some other caretaker for a vulnerable adult, um, make sure that you're aware of your state statutes for child neglect or abuse of uh, a vulnerable adult or similar statute. I've had situations where we've had to go to the caretaker or the family and remind them that, look, at you've got an obligation and you could be liable for neglect in those situations if you fail to step up and, and take appropriate action. Sometimes that convinces them to cooperate with you in um, helping place or find a solution for this particular patient. Um, if you've got a patient who just simply refuses to leave, um, but otherwise the discharge is appropriate, then what you may need to do is reduce the benefit of staying. So identify why they are staying and, you know, eliminate the gains that they might have. Um, obviously, you're going to want to provide appropriate notice to the patient, but you might consider eliminating privileges so long as it's consistent with your licensing requirements and the like. For example, take away their TV or entertainment, um, take away favorable room assignments, Take away unnecessary meals or care or extra meal choices or even any meals if they're appropriate for discharge and they're just an interloper there and you're not obligated to continue to provide care for them, then don't provide that care for them. Um, just make sure that if they do need care that you're not violating the appropriate standard of care. Um, you know, in some cases, you may want to consider subsidizing the patient's care in another care setting for a while in order to get them to leave to go to that other care setting. Um, it's not a great solution, but it may be cheaper than keeping them in your facility. If it's going to cost you $2,500 a day to keep them in your facility, plus all the um, stress and all the problems with your staff and keeping that person there, then maybe you'd be willing to subsidize their care at another appropriate setting, whether that's arranging an, a hotel or an apartment for a limited period of time, maybe subsidizing care that they might receive in a long-term care setting, uh, maybe transportation costs to another location or appropriate care setting, but I'm not saying in that situation you simply dump them off at the at the bus station. You'd want to work with them to identify another appropriate care setting and make sure you're working to transfer them to that appropriate care setting, but not necessarily just shipping them out someplace else so it's somebody else's problem. Uh, maybe um, pay for another care provider, whether it's home health or mental health care or needed medications or supplies. The key there is that you're not simply dumping the patient, but instead that you are helping transition them to another facility by subsidizing the care. It makes it easier to do, maybe makes it easier for that other facility to accept the patient or allows the patient, you know, helps the patient cover the cost so that they can transition. You do have to be aware of the fraud and abuse laws um, in those situations, such as the anti-kickback statute and the civil monetary penalties law, which among other things prohibits you from offering inducements in order to uh, reward or incentivize providing additional care. Now, in these types of situations, I'm not too concerned about the anti-kickback statute and civil monetary penalties law because your intent is not to induce 
further services or to get further services payable by government health care programs. To the contrary, you don't want to have this person um, get those services at your facility. So you're, you've got the, the contrary, the opposite inducement, which is to, to stop them from getting those services. So I'm usually not too concerned about those penalties or those statutes. You do have to be concerned about the anti-supplementation rules, though, in dealing with SNFs. That anti-supplementation rule generally prohibits SNFs from charging additional amounts for services covered by Medicare and Medicaid. So if, for example, you're a hospital, you want this patient to go to a SNF, that SNF doesn't want to accept them because there's an inadequate payer source. Um, the anti-supplementation rule generally prohibits you from offering amounts above Medicare or Medicaid in order to get them to take it. Now, the, the guidance that comes along with the, in the supplemental compliance program guidance, they specifically said, a SNF may not condition acceptance of a beneficiary from a hospital upon receiving payment from the hospital in an amount greater than the SNF would receive under the PPS. For Medicare and Medicaid beneficiaries, a nursing facility may not accept supplemental payments, including but not limited to cash and free or discounted items and services from a hospital or other source merely because of the nursing facility considers the Medicare and Medicaid payment to be inadequate. But remember that that anti-supplementation rule is not going to apply to non-Medicare or Medicaid services. It doesn't prevent donations to an unrelated to uh, that are unrelated to a specific patient, and it does not apply to legitimate arrangements to reserve beds. That compliance program guidance specifically said that. Ultimately, you may conclude that the risk for this anti-supplementation or fraud and abuse laws is lower than the cost that you have to keep that patient in your facility, um, but you're going to want to carefully weigh those situations. Another option may be if person, especially if the person's violent or a trespasser, is simply to call the police. Um, your state may have particular laws that apply in this situation. For example, in Idaho, we have a specific law that prohibits battery against a healthcare worker. So if you've got a violent person in your facility, you could call the police and have the police come down and pick that, that person. Now, the problem with that, of course, it's usually not a long-term solution because, um, one, the police may not take them because they decide that the the person lacks competency and therefore they can't stand trial and the prosecutor is not going to prosecute it, so they simply don't want to get involved. Um, if the person truly is violent and they're hurting people, the police will usually get involved, but that patient will usually end up back at your facility. So it may not be a long-term solution. Um, in a criminal trespass case, um, you know, a lot of states have the statute prohibiting criminal trespass, so that could be another reason to call the police, especially if the it's not a behavioral health problem, but it's a situation where the patient's refusing to leave. You can call the police and have the police escort the patient out under this criminal trespass statute. Um, Idaho has its own criminal trespass statute, and uh, the patient could be subject to fines in addition to uh, limited jail time or restitution, so maybe it's helpful to explain that to the patient. In, um, rather than involving the police, another alternative may be that you simply sue the person for trespass and seek an order from the court requiring the person to leave. Um, again, Idaho has a civil trespass statute. So not only is there a common law cause of action, but a specific statute that allows you to sue another person uh, under the civil trespass. You can recover damages. You could presumably also get a, an order requiring them to, to leave your facility. That civil trespass, especially if you've got a situation where um, the patient's just simply refusing to leave or the family isn't wanting them to leave and refusing to cooperate with you um, by making sure that they understand what the potential criminal penalties or civil penalties are with those trespass statutes, that can sometimes help you. Um, sometimes you may need to pursue a lawsuit in order to recover your cost of care, not only to get payment for these services, but also to make sure that the patient and or the family understand the cost that they're incurring by staying in your facility. Quite often, they may not really understand. They may think they're getting a free ride by staying in your facility because under EMTALA, if they're not stabilized, you gotta to continue to provide care. But that doesn't mean you can't charge them for it. it. Doesn't mean that they're not obligated to pay. So maybe you need to bring suit so that they feel the pain and understand that they're gonna have financial responsibility and they may be willing to work with you in order to find a more cost-effective uh, solution. Another alternative may be to file a lawsuit for appropriate injunctive relief to seek an order from the court requiring whatever it you may need, whether that's um, confirming your right to 
uh, your ability to discharge the patient, that it's not going to violate the cops or violate the standard of care or whatever, basically getting the court's blessing to discharge the patient. It may, you may seek an order uh, that confirms your right to medicate or take other appropriate action to make sure that the, the patient gets the care they need. Maybe it's, um, you know, applying appropriate um, restraints or the like. Uh, you still got to be concerned about the condition of participation and the like. Anyway, whatever it may be, you may consider um, seeking court approval. Uh, you know, whether or not the court will actually address that, who knows? But at least if you've got that court order blessing your activity, then you should have some protection if the patient or even the government, other government agencies come in there and try to uh, take adverse action against you because of the action you did take. Um, some of the things that you're going to want to document if you are going to sue, sue for injunctive relief and get a court blessing for, for the action you want to take. Um, some of the arguments you may want to assert are that the, you're, look at you're an acute care hospital. You're not licensed for long-term care. So that person being in your facility is, you're not, you're not licensed for that type of care. And that, uh, that person's presence jeopardizes your license. You should document that it is not an appropriate care setting for this particular person's needs that there are more appropriate care settings elsewhere, that it's resulting in excessive costs, uh, document the misconduct by the patient, whether it's a violation of your applicable laws, maybe assaults or violent conduct, uh, cite the OSHA general duty clause that you've got this, affirmative, this other competing regulation that requires you to take appropriate actions. You can use that as a, as a sword and able to uh, tell the judge, look, hey, we've got to comply with this, so we need to send this guy out so that we can comply with this particular statute. And you might cite that the, the hospitals, having this person here is interfering with your ability to care for other persons. If you are going to bring that lawsuit, uh, whatever it's called, whether it's uh, injunctive relief, whether it's a suit for trespass, make sure that you document your compliance with applicable statutes and regulations, including your obligations to engage in discharge planning, providing the appropriate notice and the appeal time has run, um, show that the patient is appropriate for discharge, that they satisfy the discharge criteria, that there are more appropriate care settings elsewhere, um, show that the patient is utilizing the space and services that are needed for more urgent cases, including documenting the cost of care and that the, the facility maybe is beyond its capacity, having to turn patients away because this patient's there, uh, this patient's taking up space in the behavioral health unit, and because of that, we can't take other patients that would otherwise be more appropriate for the behavioral health unit, whatever those might be. The key there is to just make sure that you overcome the, the court's hesitancy to actually kick this person out of your facility. Um, show that this patient's competent or they have do have other places to go um, and so that you can justify the, the court's decision because you will have kind of a high standard. The court's not going to want to do that. So you need to explain to them why it's appropriate for, for you to do so. There have been a number of cases that have been brought by hospitals against patients in order to kick those patients out. I cite some of them up there. Uh, if, should you ever want to read those or use those in your, your briefing with the government? Um, if you are going to file a lawsuit, just make sure that you're aware of HIPAA. Remember, HIPAA does allow you to use or disclose protected health information for healthcare operations, which includes your legal services. So filing a suit, um, you can use that information under HIPAA. Just make sure that you use the minimum necessary and take appropriate steps to uh, avoid unnecessary disclosures, including things like uh, maybe protective orders and the like. In helping do these transition or work through these options with the patient, with a family member, with other situations, consider using your ethics committee. They can help um, sometimes communicate with the uh, patient as well as uh, make sure that you're acting in an appropriate ethical manner. They're a good resource for you. Um, those are all kind of short-term solutions. If you're looking for a long-term solution, the problem is until we get more community resources, that are able to take on these people and until the legislature is willing to step in and assume care for a lot of these people. All of these are just kind of temporary fixes. Our problem is we just don't have the resources in our in our healthcare system to take care of a lot of these people. And until the legislator and the state is willing to step in and assume that, we're going to continue to have these problems. Um, for a long-term solution, you should identify and establish community resources, including behavior, available behavioral health resources. You know, work to increase funding for appropriate care settings. 
establish a network of facilities who are willing to accept patients, establish agreements with long-term care facilities, for example, by which the hospital says, hey, we'll, we'll take this patient. If you send them over here, we'll provide the acute care for them, but you have to agree to receive the patient back. That may not be a, a complete solution, but by having those types of proactive steps, proactive arrangements in place that can help you. Um, you may want to consider establishing a working group among hospitals and other stakeholders to consider alternatives and maybe taking that to the legislature. Possible legislation that may help um, ameliorate or mitigate some of these problems is consider passing laws that allow the hospital to discharge a patient who meets discharge criteria regardless of other licensing limitations. Modify your uh, commitment proceedings to make sure that it would allow you to initiate appropriate commitment proceedings to get these people into state custody and require the state to step in and assume responsibility. Maybe impose bed hold requirements on long-term care facilities or assisted living facilities that require them to take the patient back. Reduce or loosen standards for assisted living facilities so that they may accept more problem patients and don't have to be worried about, you know, taking these patients and suddenly having the state citing them for keeping patients that they the state doesn't think they're safe to keep. Uh, provide perhaps pass legislation to provide immunity to hospitals that attempt to provide care in good faith, even though they're acting outside their licensure or, um, you know, they can't necessarily protect all of their staff because you have patients who are beating up others. You know, take steps to, to try to protect the hospitals. Um, North Carolina has an interesting statute. They actually passed a, a law that, um, that um, provides protection to the hospital. It says that in the case of a patient who refuses or fails to leave the hospital upon discharge by the attending physician shall be reviewed by any such case, shall be reviewed by two physicians licensed to practice medicine in the state, one of whom may be the attending physician, if in the opinion of the physicians, the patient should be discharged as cured or is no longer needing the treatment of the, or for the reason that the treatment cannot benefit the patient's case or other good and sufficient reasons, the patient's refusal to leave shall constitute a trespass and the patient shall be guilty of a class three minor or misdemeanor. So you could maybe pass some kind of legislation like this that provides a, a mechanism for you to send the patient out and protects the hospital for that decision. Um, in most of your states, you probably don't need that. For example, in Idaho, we already have that criminal trespass case that, that probably would satisfy this, but, but you might consider passing other legislation. All right. Unfortunately, I don't have the answer to all these situations. These are very problematic and quite frankly, among the most, the least satisfying calls that I get from providers because um, there aren't good solutions. There isn't a clear process, at least under Idaho law and in the law of most other states, for sending these patients out. And hospitals are left to grapple with these, these difficult situations where they balance the needs of the patient versus the resources available at the hospital. And again, until we uh, fix the healthcare system, we're going to continue to grapple with that. Hopefully, though, I've at least provided some options or some ideas, some ways that you might be able to address some of these situations and get them resolved while limiting your liability. All right, that is it. Thank you very much. If you've got questions about any of this, um, I certainly do also. <laughs> um, but feel free to shoot me an email or use the chat feature, submit those questions, and I'll try to respond to those offline as I, as I can. I hope you all have a great Thanksgiving, great holidays, and we'll see you next month. Our uh, next webinar will be uh, kind of a compliance review of compliance issues that have occurred over the past year and, and looking forward, what are, the, what are the key issues that you need to be concerned about in your hospital or facility or practice? Thanks so much.